Hello and welcome to the first episode of a History of Warfare show. Today we'll be covering a brief overview of warfare. Yes, we'll discuss the eight periods of warfare history. One, the Fantastical Era. Two, the Stone Age. Three, the Bronze Age. Four, the Iron Age. Five, Medieval Age. Six will be the Renaissance Age. Seven is the Industrial Age. And finally, eighth, the Information Age. While some of these time periods are considered as fact by historical scholars, these eight periods also cover the biblical history of warfare beyond the accepted timeline. Let's begin with the Fantastical Age. The Fantastical Age is the one we speak of. The writer for this episode wanted to begin with this amazing period because of the technological uh, advancements that were discovered, that were discovered and then lost. Indeed, reading in Genesis 4, we observe the last recorded descendants of Cain, Adam's wicked son, who killed his brother named Tubal Cain. He is said to have discovered how to create bronze and iron tools only a little over a thousand years before the Bronze and Iron Age. It seems strange since there doesn't appear to be any warfare going on. However, the most likely explanation was on account of the following chapters in Genesis 6, Matthew 24, and the book of Enoch, describing violence and war between the children of the serpent and the righteous children of Adam. Noah is described as pure of his generation. Yes, because the war of, mi the war of mixing incompatible species between fallen angels and humans, God destroys the world to save the last line with pure human blood. This war began with the rebellion of Lucifer against God. The fantastical age with the flood purging the mixed species from the world. So the immediate result of the flood is a loss of the previous era's technology. The Stone Age soon follows, beginning at the Tower of Babel, when it describes the material the people used to build. Nimrod and his kingdom of Babylon uh, would soon engage in warfare against the surrounding peoples scattered by the languages. Just like Cain, when he took a stone to kill his brother, so the lack of technology forced the peoples, already afraid of one another and seeking after the basic needs of survival, to become jealous and fight over the resources. Sharpening sticks for spears, bows, and arrows, the only protection one would be a walled city of stone or a palisade. Now, much of what we know about the Stone Age warfare comes from the area of Mesopotamia and the Eastern Mediterranean, especially from legends from Sumerian texts of Gilgamesh, the Greek novel Iliad, and of course, the older books of the Bible, while kingdoms in Oriental Asia, Africa, Europe, and Americas are less clear, though much of their combat evolved around the same time as well. With the rise of the Bronze Age, an update to the donkey-drawn battle cart became the horse-drawn chariot, turning the tide of many large armies of archers and spearmen into aristocratic professional fighting forces. Like the tanks of today, such armies as the Egyptians, Canaanites, and Hittites, these kingdoms were much more visible, much more mobile versus an army only made up of footmen. Without chariots, the Israelites had to rely on God to turn the battles in their favor during the days of Joshua, Barak, and Deborah, and Samson. Moving on to the Iron Age, we see it ends with the Bronze Age rather quickly as the bronze weapons shattered against the more durable iron ones. Early armies to implement these were the Hittites, Philistines, who completed with one, competed with one another by in establishing an alliance with Israel by providing their enemies with or without iron weapons. For example, the Philistines kept the iron workers out of Israel during Saul's day, while David used Hittite allies to provide his army with the latest advanced weaponry. Single state empires, including the Assyrians, Babylonians, Persians, Greek, and Macedonians, boldly used their ingenuity, iron weapons, and various military tactics to carve out territory, overlapping the former claims and uh, creating diverse alliances. I thought they said clans. To bolster their armies, finally, Rome conquered these former territories into a vast empire stretching from Spain to Israel. However, as we know, Rome would not last forever, and while Constantine managed to establish the eastern half into the Holy Roman Empire that lasted until the Gunpowder Age in 1453, eventually a coalition of Germanic clans attacked and sacked the very heart of the empire, leading into what many call the Dark Ages. Mostly just because, once again, a loss of many technologies, briefly returning to bronze weapons. Despite this, a medieval age began as territories became a mix of commoners relying on a rich noble to provide shelter from invaders while they gave him a share of their crops and livestock. While horsemen had played a crucial role during the late Bronze Age and for much of the Iron Age, 
on account of the lack of stirrups, it wasn't until the medieval age that the knight on horseback became so popular. Diving deeper into this idea of the noble knight on horseback, mobile armored knights exploded onto the battlefield and would remain a force to be reckoned with until World War I machine guns literally tore apart the cavalry charges. Though useful during many battles, horsemen were vulnerable to fast-moving objects such as arrows and bullets and could be outmaneuvered by lightly armored opponents. An early victory during Saladin's rise to power saw an entire army of mounted crusaders destroyed after being drawn out into the desert by the more mobile Muslim raiders. During the Hundred Years' War at Agincourt, English longbowmen unsaddled thousands of noble French knights. As was stated previously, the medieval age saw the rise of serfdom, lower classes living on the property of a nobleman who provided protection and shelter from raids by Vikings and other raiders while providing the noble a tax of crops or livestock. At first, these fortresses, typically stone castles, provided ample means of protection. As, raider, As raiders found less and less success just preying on the lower classes for food and supplies, the greed for gold and valuables for nobility drove better siege engines. Most siege equipment throughout history involved battering rams to break down the gate and ladders to scale the walls. The evolution of long-range catapults, known as trebuchets, could pound down the stone walls much more efficiently. The largest trebuchet, called Warwolf, was constructed under orders by England's King Edward I during the Scottish Wars of Independence. Remember the movie Braveheart? The trebuchet was already in use in China during the Bronze Age, but the West would not begin utilizing these machines of war until the 6th and 7th century A.D. As the Crusades began, trebuchets would be used to their full extent in the many sieges across the Middle East. Religion had a lot to play in the wars that would cross across the various boundaries of human civilization. Christianity utilized its hand in politics by playing off the greed of the rulers who placed Christ as their state religion to baptize the masses whether in water or blood. Islam also arose during this time, resulting in a state almost as violent as the Christian empires, conquering the Middle East, North Africa, and most of Spain. For 200 years, Christian and Muslims would dispute the Holy Land, coveted by Christians for the home ground of Christ, and for Muslims, the origin of Muhammad and Ishmael, son of Abraham. Christians also began to attack and kill Jews, calling them Christ killers using the ex excuse to plunder them for gold when not on crusade in the Middle East. Many things were done in the name of religion that would eventually lead to the exploration, discovery, and settling of the Americas. In 1453, the Muslims, known as the Ottomans, set their sights on the last Christian stronghold in the far northern west of the Middle East, Constantinople. Besides their armies of Christian children turned Islamic warriors, called Janizars, the Ottomans also brought a new weapon, a monstrous 26-foot-long cannon. For six weeks and firing seven times a day, they unleashed this weapon against the strong walls of Constantinople. While not as effective compared to the trebuchets, it was the first time gunpowder weapons were used in the warfare in the West. While the Orient had already been using gunpowder for hundreds of years, the Ottomans were the first to use these weapons as a Euro-Turkish power. As the Renaissance age persisted, gunpowder weapons would become less cumbersome, more accurate, and easier to use. From the blunderbuss to the musket, the gunpowder weapons allowed smaller armies to overcome much larger forces. Now, the real war began as people accepted science over superstition, which led to a rise in atheism, especially as wars between Catholic and Christians and Protestant Christians erupted all over Europe. In Oriental Asia, Japan was experiencing its own troubles with those accepting Christianity, starting rebellions against the ruling daimyo, eventually shutting its borders to all foreigners until the last few years of the Industrial Age. All the wars between the religions caused many Europeans to flee to the Americas, where the promise of religious tolerance gave hope to many persecuted people. However, wars with the natives and the European powers forced the new colonies to find ways to produce the supplies they needed without relying on alliances across the sea to rescue them. The Industrial Age had begun. Known as the First and Second Industrial Age, uh, industrial Revolution that lasted from 1760 to 1914, these movements encouraged people to move into the cities and ultimately discouraged slavery. Slavery had originally been used as a large, cheap labor force, but with the rise of machines, it ended the effective need of manual labor in favor of mass production. 
we see an example of this in the American Civil War. The Union Army was much better equipped with versus their southern opponents. Europe was already seeing the effects of industrial productivity after the abolition of the slave trade long before the Americas did. As the British expanded their empire, their industrial means allowed them to conquer more colonies in Africa and India. Probably the most strange aspects of warfare was seeing the battle between Old World armies versus New World armies, such as the Zulu Wars and the Americans versus the native tribes. Even though defeat was always the result for the Old World armies, Americans and Europeans paid for their disruption with incompetent glory hogs and unnecessary loss. Despite the industrial machine of the colonial powers, besides the, the Americas, most European empires had lost these territories in the following Napoleonic, Crimean, and Germanic war towards the end of the industrial age. New weapons were being utilized on armies that were still using tactics such uh, since the Renaissance age. Galling machine guns versus tight squares of infantry marching across open fields, horses charging were becoming the thing of the past. And as global war broke out, these tactics were going to be changed as the information age began. The political intrigues and revolutions of the previous uh, era had finally pushed the European powers to an edge that going to war seemed like fun. In the past, two armies would charge at one another, kill the poor and save the rich for ransom, and finally ride home to tea and feast. Like a game of chess, war was always the deadliest for the lower classes while it was a good, was good sporting show for the wealthy as they showed their badge of courage. Now, every man found themselves blown away by automatic weapons and saw at no man as greater or less than deserving of a gruesome end. In World War I, the greatest amounts of soldiers died, while in World War II, the greatest casualty count came from the civilian population being bombed and nuked. Gone were the glorious days of war. It became a live-or-die situation by day. With each successful war, humans began to assess the cost of dying for their countries and the economical cost of fighting other countries. So we are now so reliant on one another that if just one country declares war, food and gas prices go up, we have less of some items over others, and unlike previous wars, where religion and faith was relied upon to hope that the war would change something, most don't believe that the battles can change anything. Just more death and starvation for everyone. It's a rough world we live in where nowadays we constantly live under. When we live under threat of war, such as nuclear war, and we have these economic issues that if a country falls apart, we're all going to have to spend more money on gas, which that affects everyone, at least especially me. Yeah, yeah, it, it, you know, it does. That's a good point. You look, look at the recent... Uh, disruption where that barge, uh, actually that boat hit that bridge. And you know you think about the loss of life, but you also think that's a major bridge connecting uh, jobs and communities across uh, a waterway in Baltimore. And so there's been discussion about it being maybe a hack job. So if someone were to hack uh, circuitry or techno technological infrastructure, they can also ruin physical infrastructure. Whereas before, in the old world, you'd have to burn a boat, you'd have to burn the ships. Yeah, so, I mean, it's the same thing with the war in Ukraine, right? I mean, now that was the breadbasket of Europe. Now the cost of bread went up, and also with, of course, the devastation of buildings. We see very similar things in Israel. War has just gotten so much worse nowadays when it's just missiles that can hit a building and kill people without even, even looking them in the face. It's, it's wild what kind of things can happen now when there is that kind of devil's devastational power available to just all men. It is. It really is. And uh, to, to, to conclude, I would say that we just have to really, you know, it sounds a little, little cheesy, but the thing that solves all of this is just people recognizing we're one species. We love one another. Till we grasp that, we're just going to keep doing it. It's a, it's a cycle. Amen. Well, that's about all the time we have for today. God bless.